Wasn't that great? How exciting. It's so great to serve God. That's so awesome. We do have safe haven today. So if you're a kid that's under the age of kid, first through fifth grade, physically, not mentally, physically, I know, I want to go. They have fun in there, but first through fifth grade, if you want to go, go ahead and go on to Children's Church, Safe Haven, where they're going to do cool stuff. I heard there was candy, so I might cut out early if that's okay with you guys. Go get me some candy. (laughs) I'm just kidding. So we're talking about the struggle is real today. That's what our topic title is. I like it. It's nifty. Right? Today we're going to be in our passage. Like I said, we are, we are, we're announcing our rebranding today. So I felt it was only fitting that we talked about the passage that our, church, our youth group is going to from now on hold. And this is the direction we're going. So we're going to be in 1 Peter 5, and 6, 5, verse 6. We will be using a little bit more of the chapter later on. But right now that's our verse. So if you guys want to stand, if you can stand, if you don't want to stand, that's okay too. It's 12 words, so we got this. Let's read it. It says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll dive into this passage. Father God, Lord, you're so incredible. We just can't say that enough. We can say it every day, every second of the day, and it still wouldn't be enough on how amazing you are to us and the tools you give us that we need when, when we need them. So, Lord, as we go through this, I pray this is just your word. This is you. This is you reminding us of the gift that you've given us so freely, of the tools you give us so freely. So be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys may be seated. So, like I said, I thought it'd be nice if we just went over the verse that our youth group is going to start following on. And that's our verse right there. Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, so that he might exalt you at a proper time. I like it. It's catchy. It's one of my favorites. It's so powerful. It's a very, very powerful verse in this. So in this mind of going over our verse, there's a couple of things that, that, to think about. And one of the thoughts that I go, run through my head is, how much do we tend to get caught up into life? Not church life, but just life in general. We let the world come in on us, whether, whether we're, we always seem to be focused on something, whether it's good or bad, but we always seem to have a general focus on what we need, like money. We need money. We tend to worry about money a lot, don't we? Whether we have enough or we have too much. I haven't heard anybody complain about having too much, but if you have complaints... You come talk to me, and I will gladly take some off your hands for you. But we, we tend to struggle over some of these things. We tend to struggle over money, right? That's, that's a big one because our bills got to be paid. One of the other things we tend to struggle over is our title. Well, this, is more, this is a lot more common if you're like in the military and stuff like that. But it still happens. We struggle over the title in which we are addressed, my status of where I'm at, whether I'm Large and in charge, or I'm in the bottom of the barrel. But we tend to struggle and stress out over that. We tend to worry about power. How much power do I actually have? How much power can I use to control whatever goes on in my life? Whether it's family, whether it's stuff at home, whether it's stuff at work, whether it's stuff at school. How much power do I actually have to be in control? Because we like to be in control, don't we? Do we not? Right? That's exciting. Ooh, the biggest one of all, right? Material of nature. How many times do we stress out or we worry about whether we have something or we don't have something? And I'm not talking about basic necessities like food, power, shelter, stuff like that. I'm talking about like, wow, my neighbor just got that brand new truck and I don't have a truck at all. What's going on here? How many times do we really stress about that? And see, this is, with, with, with thinking about that, as we go into our rebranding, as we're changing the youth group, one of the common things that comes in is us as adults, we can say, yes, we struggle with that. Us as teenagers, oh, we struggle with it every day. Because we're trying to figure out how to be adults. The only difference is us adults, we know how to kind of just bottle it up until eventually we explode. Teenagers, we just explode. It's just overflowing, right? And so as we go into this verse, this verse fits perfectly for that because we intend struggle with things. That's the reality of the nature. Is we as people, we as sinners, struggle with things. Doesn't matter what it is. We all struggle with something, right? 
And so, so what we're going to do is we're going to break down a couple parts of this verse. Then we're going to read a little bit later on in the chapter to see why this verse is so important. But I, this verse that Peter wrote here is so powerful. And the first thing I want to break down about it is the very first two words he says. He says, humble yourselves. Wow. It's not working. Oh, it's working again. Humble ourselves, right? That's such a powerful statement alone. Without even going to the wait for the mighty hand of God to exalt you. Humble yourself. Now, that's a funny word, humble. Um, when you're young, you don't know what that means. <laughs> I know, because I run into that issue all the time. But what, is, what does humbleness actually look like? Do we really know, genuinely? I'm going to tell you. It's exciting, right? Because humbleness is, is being able to take yourself down to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. Whether it's admit that you're going through something. Whether it's admit that you're not as awesome as you think you are, whether it's bringing yourself where you cry in the shower, but you're not in the shower, right? Crying in the shower. My boys know. They know the secret, right? No, but you, you bring yourself down to the bottom of the bottom. That's humbling yourself. That's bringing yourself down to the bottom so you can be built back up. And see, this is the biggest thing right here as we go through this, because he says to humble ourselves and wait for the mighty hand of God to exalt us. That's perfect verse. I can memorize that. Anybody, we should all have that memorized by, before we even leave here. But let me ask you something. When you stress about something, when you really start to worry about those things, how many of y'all, your first answer is, all right, God, let's do it. That's exactly, that's my answer too. No, it's not. We're, we're the first ones to be like, what the heck? Wow. And we either do two things. We either completely forget God exists, and we're like, I got this. Or we blame God and push God to the corner because it's God's fault that whatever's happening to me is happening to me. And so how dare God? So God needs to go stand in the timeout chair. (laughs) That's what we do, right? And let's be honest here. Is that not what we do? Why do we do that? The answer is simple. We, in our sinful nature, let our pride get in front of us. We let that pride overwhelm us and we let that, I'm good, I don't need any help. help. Asking for help is... That's not me. I'm a Christian. I'm great. I can do anything. We take that verse, I can do anything. What is it? Four, Philippians 4.13? I can do anything with Christ in me, right? Except we forget the with Christ in me. We just leave the I can do anything. We just stop. I can do all things, right? When in the case, that's not the, the case. In the case, we're actually, when we're struggling through things and we're going through things, we push God into a corner. We forget he exists. And the next thing we know, we're, what is going on here? Why, 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 why? When the answer is right in front of us the whole time. And so, so the first thing Peter tells us we have to do to understand that is first thing we have to do is humble ourselves. Why? Take your pride and throw it out the door. Because your pride is what is stopping you from getting your issues fixed. Or what is stopping you from doing that. And here's how it's stopping you. Let me explain, right? He goes in the next part. He says, wait for the mighty hand of God to exalt you. Let me ask you something. How big is God's hand? You already know. Pretty big, right? Realistically, in the Bible, we know it's humongous. It can create everything, right? Let me ask you another question. This is where it gets really deep. How big do you think God's hand is? Because you think about that question, how big do you actually think God's hand is? Because we tend to let our pride take over and say, I can do this, when God's hand is right there. We just got to wait for it. We just got to ask for it. And we're going to read about that in a minute. But see, think about it. God forms you in your mother's womb. He knows all the hairs on your head. He can count them and tell you numbers in 17 billion different languages. And you still know the exact number of hair on your head, including the ones that you're losing. He knows. He knows how many, he can tell you the number of how many you're going to lose, right? Think about his hand, right? The, we're talking about the guy, the God that is so powerful that took out sinless cities. The God that is so powerful that flooded the earth, not from the sky, but from the water coming from the ground. How big do we put God's hand when we're going through something, when we're struggling through something, whether, no matter what it is, how big do we actually put God's hand We know that God's so powerful, we know God's so great, but we let our pride get so much in front of us that we take God's hand and we make it small. We make it like an infant's hand. And we say, God, I'll grab your hand when I need it and hope you can pull me up. Rather than, God, your hand has always been there and all I need to do is hug onto it. 
How big is it? Because we're called to wait for our mighty hand to exalt us, right? We tend to get so caught up in everything in the real world. We tend to get so caught up and so like important about everything that we let our pride get in front of us. We let our, our, our sin get in front of us. We let that be in front of us and say, this is who we are. When in reality, God wants us. God needs us. God calls for us to call for him. And, and this is where we're going to go on to the rest of that passage here. I'm not going to make you guys stand. Don't worry. But here's the rest of that passage here. We're going to read 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 5. If you want to follow along, you can. I have it on the board. It says, cast all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is on the prowl around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him firm in faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by fellow believers throughout the world. This is, this is where that, that part, we listen to that verse and we're like, humble ourselves, wait for the mighty hand of God. He's going to exalt us. It's going to be great. Why? A big question. I love, writing, I love reading Peter's writings because he's, he's always like, go do this. But then he tells you why. He's not, he's not like Paul that says, go do this. And then you're like, let me read the context to find out why. No, he's, he's very, very straightforward for it. He says, humble yourselves. Why? Because God loves you and God wants you to cast your cares on him. He wants you to cast your problems on him because he loves you and he cares for you. And he wants you in his life. He wants you. What does that pastor say? Our God is a very jealous God. He wants our attention. But we let our pride get in front of us. And we let our pride... Push him to the corner. When he's saying, I care about you and I want you to come to me. Right? And then he says, be sober-minded. Be, be that minded, right? Don't, don't fill that void, right? We all struggle through things. And one of the th- t- nine, so, wow, I can't talk. I'm getting too excited, right? One of the things we tend to struggle with is we tend to take that and try to use something else to fill the problem that we're struggling with, whether drugs, alcohol, you know, pills, whatever it is. But we tend to put something else there because I don't have to worry about my pride if I put something else in front of it. And then now all of a sudden it's that's problem, not my problem. When that's not the case. And so he says, be sober-minded. Be ready. Don't put something in your problems. Don't put something in front of you. Why? Because the devil's on the prowl like a roaring lion. He's ready for you. And see, this is where we have to really look at our pride, and we really have to push our pride and say, what are we doing? Because the reality is, that pride, a little bit of pride, and and we, we tend, I like to think I have a little bit of pride. That's not the case. But I like to think it's small. And we let that little pride come, and that little pride, that, little, that devil is like, oh, hello, little pride. Let me see that. Let me see that real quick. Let me make that big pride and bigger pride and bigger pride. And next thing you know, our problems that we're struggling with are greater than we think we can, are bigger than we think we know, are stronger than we think we know. Next thing we know, we feel we have no way out. Next thing you know, we feel alone. We feel like nothing is going on in the world when that's not the case because Peter writes it in there and he tells you, resist him. Be firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering is being experienced by fellow believers throughout the world. See, God, he, he, I love this part because he tells us, wait, humble yourself. Throw your pride away. Bring yourself down because that mighty hand of God is there, and he's going to exalt you. He's going to take you, and he's going to let him shine through you as long as you persevere through it. And he says, why? What is the motivation to persevere through it? Because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but one of the things that I struggle with is waiting for God to be God. I want God to be God right now, not God to be God when God wants to be God. I, don't, I want his plan to be done right now, especially when I'm struggling through something. I'm like, I want it now. Come on. Let's go. I see what you're, I know you're doing something, but what are you doing? I want to see it now. And that's not the case. And he says, why wait? Where's your motivation? I'll tell you where the motivation is. He says, because somebody else in the world that believes in the same thing you believe is going through the exact same thing. So he says, resist him. And he humbles it and he brings it up into a, a big, well, let's sum this all up. If you want to really summarize it for something that Everybody understands something we all know, but we tend to forget because we let our pride get in the front, get in front of us. And the real reality of the question of the thing is, why do we need to come to God? Oh, wow, come on, hold on, it's coming, it's coming. There it is. God loves you. That's the reality of the the matter. Why do we need to throw our pride away? Because no matter what we're struggling with, 
no matter what's hard in our lives, no matter what's beating down on us, and the reality of the matter is, no matter how hard any of that is, God still loves you. God still sent his son to die for you. And that's the reality of the matter. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what the world says we need to go through. What matters is the fact that there's a God that loves you, that wants you to be ready so you can shine him, so he can show the world him. And that's the reality of it. Why are we going for this verse, the rebranding? Why did the primal go to the primal? Well, it's original, right? Primal means original. Our God is a God who's original. He's not stealing somebody else's ideas. He's God. He created the ideas. And so in the reality is, why are we going in this direction? Because look at the rates, look at the numbers, look at the statistics, whatever you want to call it. Younger people are not coming to church. And it's not because they're not coming to church because we're not invited them. It's because they don't understand that God loves them. They don't understand that when they're going through something hard, guess what? We've all gone through it. And we're all ready for it. And we're all ready because we know when you, what happens at the end of the game. And so we're doing this rebranding. We're going into this stuff because to understand something for all of us to understand is we cannot forget that God loves you and God wants you in his will. God wants you to serve his purpose. Not your purpose. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with because in the end of the day, when we persevere it, when we give it to God, we cast our cares on God, God's going to win. God's going to shine. God's going to be lifted up. And that's a win. No longer do we put God in the corner and time out chair for being bad. We say, God, you, you made this mess, right? Think about it. You're a parent. You make a mess, you have to clean it up. Because if not, when you tell your little child to go clean up that mess, they'll be like, well, you don't clean up your mess. I know this. My three-year-old told me that the other day, believe it or not. Daddy, you don't clean up after you. Why do I got to clean up my room? I'll go clean up that room real quick, right? When we make a mess, we clean it up. When you're struggling through something, when you're going through something, no longer putting the one that, that, that can help you through it in the corner. Come on, let's do it. Let's go clean it up. And, and we bring it into the question because when you come into that and we show that, it shows somebody else that God loves you. Because believe it or not, whether they want to believe it or not, the world sees when you're struggling. They know that. And that's okay. What they look for is, what do you do while you're struggling? That's what they really want to know as Christians. They, they, they make fun of us and they say that all the time. But when we struggle, that's when they're like, what are they going to do? Let's watch them. So what you do while you struggle could be the one thing that leads somebody to Christ. Could be the one thing that shows God's love. Just tell somebody that God loves you. And so the question becomes, as, as we go through this, the one question that really becomes is the... Hold on. Oh, there it is. The one question that really becomes is, what is your struggle? Because we all have something. Are you willing to come and let your struggle go? Are you willing to take your struggle and stop putting it in a bottle and saying, I got this, because in reality, we don't? That's okay. It's okay to not have it. Because God's got it. He has that hand. He's mighty. He's strong. He's got the power. So God has it. So the question becomes, what are you willing to give to God? question becomes do you know who christ actually is because let me tell you something if you're really struggling and you don't and you feel like something's missing in your life let me tell you what's missing it's christ i was telling the kids the other day you can't tell me one time christ has done something bad to me no nobody has a story where christ oh christ did this you don't have a bad story about christ ever you never hear a negative story about oh wow christ really changed my life into me addicted to drugs You never hear that. Why? Because Christ is good. He died for you. He loves you. And so if you don't know him, it's time to know him. Because he's ready for you. You want your struggles to go away, it's time to come know the one that's going to take them away, that paid for those sins, that paid for that struggle. That's the reality of it. We're going to enter our invitation time, and that's the time where it's my favorite time. I tell it all the time, and I continue to tell it because invitation is my favorite time because we get so caught up in the world. We get so caught up through our week. How much time do we honestly say we, we go to God? 
not, not, and when I mean go to God, it's not, I woke up and did my quiet time real quick so I can get on with the rest of my day. How many times do you actually say, you know what, I've got three hours to kill. Let's just go pray to God for three hours. We don't. I'm not giving you three hours right now. I mean, if you want three hours, I'll sit here and wait with you. But, but invitation time is my favorite time because it's the time where you get to go to God and nobody else is looking because everybody else should be going to God for the same thing. Or a different version of that thing, but we all should be going to God, right? The invitation is my favorite time because it's a time where when you need help and you feel like there's no way out, that's the time you get to grab one of your brothers and sisters and ask them for help. It's the time that we're here and we're, we're supposed to be together. We're a family. You, you ask your family for help. So as we enter this time of invitation and we enter this time of, of just coming to God, the, two, the, the things I, I urge you is if you need help, ask somebody. Anybody here will pray for you. Anybody. If you need extra special help, you can come find me. I'll be up here. You can go to Pastor Ryan. Pastor Ryan's somewhere. He's right there. But he'll probably move over there or over there or over here. He'll just be somewhere. Just find him. He'll be ready for you. And we're ready for you. If you want to know who Jesus is, come up here. Come find out who he is. Let me tell you the greatest story of everything that's going to happen to you. Right? If you want to become a member, now's the time to do that. Because as you come in as, as a membership, guess what? Membership is more than just saying, this is my home. Membership is more than just saying, this is a place I want to be. Membership is saying, this is the family I want to be a part of that's going to help me when I struggle through something. Now's the time for that. And you know what? If none of those options sound good, guess what? The altar is open. You get to come and come to God. The feet of God. And you just get to, God, these are my struggles. I'm sorry. Please. And guess what? Just like the perfect dad, he'll come and say, it's okay. Come on, let's do it. And he'll be there to fix it. Let's pray and let's just go into our invitation to the amazing God we have. God, we struggle so much. But we are so prideful, a group of people that you made us, that we refuse to ask for help. In reality, that's not the case. We need help. So, Lord, as we enter this time of invitation, we enter this time where we get to just come to you and we get to beg for help and know that you're going to help us. I pray that you're with us. I pray that you're just here to fill that struggle. Lord, if someone doesn't know Christ, I pray that you tell them it's time. You touch that heart. You tell them it's time. You struggle no more when you have the greatest thing to ever happen to you happen. Lord, be with us as we enter this time of invitation that, that we get to just approach you humbly. We get to just approach you and we get to pray to you and love you and we get to worship you and come back to you because we have strayed. And we get the excitement, the tears of joy knowing that you bring us back. So be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're so glad you could join us today. We're so excited.